The Winnipeg Jets are 0 and 2, and that was a tough California road trip for Winnipeg. We're going to talk about the future of the Jets, so let's get through today's game. And then on the back half of the video, I'm going to tell you what this means for the Jets, because right now the Jets are all in, baby. They've spent right to the cap every cent they have. Teams do not do that unless they think they are cup ready, and they've started off 0 and 2. What does that mean for Chevy? What does that mean for Maurice? What is it going to mean for the Jets going forward? All of that today after we break down this game and we go through each goal for you. I'll give you my thoughts. Roll the intro. So the Jets today started off the same way they started against the Ducks. Like a house on fire. First period was all Jets. It is the Stanley Cup contending team that everybody thinks that they are. And then unfortunately, adversity strikes and the Jets completely collapse. A second team, a Jets team playing with the lead or neutral. And then there is a Jets team that gets scored on and unfortunately just reverts to some really poor habits. The Jets didn't play good in their own D zone. The Jets had absolutely no sense of battle. Teams that are Stanley Cup ready do not allow certain things to crush them. And that first shorthanded goal that the Sharks got to make it two to one crushed the Jets tonight. Their will was beaten out of them. You could see it. They got 10 shots in the first period and outshot San Jose like crazy, outplayed San Jose like crazy. And then in the second and the third period, it was all San Jose after that first goal in the second period by Andrew Cogliano. Let's go take a look at the goals because it'll help me iterate what I'm going to talk about later on in this video. Goal number one for the Jets is an awesome individual effort here by Dubois. Lovely one-on-one -on -one battle in front of the net. Then he uses that big body and frame of his to pivot open, get his stick on the puck, get his own rebound and tip it in. As that puck goes D to D and Dylan puts the puck on net, you can see here, Pierre-Luc Dubois not only wins the battle, but he gets his stick on the puck. This is incredibly difficult and really crafty by a big power forward that has a high skill cap. Dubois continues to battle, uses that skill cap to put the puck in the net off the Aiden Hill rebound. So that is why this is a large one-on-one -on -one effort. This puck does not go in if Dubois doesn't win that battle. Goal number two, Adam Lowry left brain, Andrew Kopp right brain. They should always be paired together. They're just fantastic when they're together. Lowry here ends up chasing this puck down that's early into the zone. And instead of taking the path directly to the puck, the Wiley veteran ends up taking a little snake path, realizing where the bounce is going to go. And he gets a beautiful assist to Andrew Kopp gliding in. Andrew Kopp is sitting out in front. It's a simple feed out here to the slot. This is a green chance because it's going from south to north changes the angle on Aiden Hill goal goes in Sharks you got to find where your late man is and pick him up so not a great job done by the Sharks either and remember if you're new to hot garbage sports and you just like that breakdown that you've seen you're not going to get breakdowns like that in any other channel smash the like smash the subscribe stick with us the whole way Jets fan or not we cover all 32 teams but we do have a bit of a bias a bit a massive bias to the Winnipeg Jets on Jets game day other than that we're a very pragmatic hockey channel here you're going to learn something along the way all right so the first thing you see here in the zone is you're battling three on three you got three Jets versus three Sharks. On a power play, this is not what you want. You actually want to have four. So Blake Wheeler's right behind my head playing on the point. Wheeler actually needs to creep in here and make this a four on three battle. They send two, Jets send three, they send four, Jets send five. You always need one more man on that puck than what the opposing team is sending out there. Three on three is not ideal. It is for the Sharks. That's exactly what you wanted a penalty kill, but it's not ideal for the Jets. And then what ends up happening on a three on three battle, because these are 50-50 pucks. I mean, even amount of people, even amount of odds. It's very simple. That puck actually squirts out to the middle and then gets stick lifted over to the corner here. And then what you're going to notice is what we call wrong side of the puck, right side of the puck. The right side of the puck is when you're on good defensive side positioning, meaning you're between the puck and your own goaltender. So if the puck isn't on your stick you want to be on the right side of the puck meaning you want to be between the puck and your goalie even in the offensive zone if you don't have the puck on your stick you're playing defense doesn't matter what zone you're in in this play you're going to notice three jets get caught on the wrong side of the puck and that is where the team breakdown occurs so we have a team breakdown playing three on three and then we have a team breakdown being on the wrong side of the puck so here it is three jets one two three all on the wrong side of the puck anything across this line is the right side of the puck so this right here is the right side. This right here is the wrong side. The second last mistake made on this play is Blake Wheeler here on the wall. You can see him just below my mouse cursor here and my big head. The puck is now 
over here. This is too much gap for Blake Wheeler to step up in. You only want to pinch when you have 100% opportunity to get the puck. Not the man here because it's odd man. So you have one, two, three sharks on the right side of the puck. That's trouble for the Jets. Blake Wheeler doesn't want to pinch here. You want to back up. But Blake Wheeler does pinch. It's unfortunately a mistake that forwards make, especially on the power play at times, and it ends up costing the Jets a shorthanded goal. But this isn't just on Wheeler. All three Jets were on the wrong side. Here we see Wheeler's unable to make it to the puck. The puck is here circled, and now they're gone on a three-on-one. So we can see the puck being shot here by Cogliano. Connor Hellebuck makes the final mistake on this, making this a six-man breakdown. Connor Hellebuck's way too far in his crease here. His angle has basically given Cogliano a massive short side here, and for a six-foot-four, six-foot-five goalie like Hellebuck, there shouldn't be a lot of room up here to score. Hellebuck has been too deep in his crease the last two games, and this puck ends up beating him short side on a three-on-one. That is the worst thing that can happen to a goaltender, is losing that short-sided shot. If the puck gets across the middle and crosses the Royal Road to go in, so be it. That's a tough goal to stop for a goalie, but you gotta have these ones. And that's where the game totally changes. It's a complete backbreaker. All six players and your best players from your goalie up to Mark Shifley at center know they made a mistake on that play. And now panic starts to set in. Excellent teams who are gunning for the Stanley Cup and have the ability to close out an 82 game season plus all these series find ways to shake this off. Unfortunately, the Jets didn't shake this one off tonight and this started the collapse and four unanswered goals. The game totally flipped. They got outshot. They got out hit. They ended up even getting out. Like they, they just got outplayed completely. This particular play shut the Jets down in its entirety. And that's not what you want to see. Uh, that's a mentality thing when you get onto the bench, the players, I mean, I've been on the bench, you got to tap each other on the pads and you got to let each other know, hey, it's just one, we'll get back into it. The hallmark of a Stanley Cup team is to be able to recover from things like that, but the Jets have 80 more games to figure that out. The concern I have with the Jets is the same as every other fan. This core has been together for so long, plus five years, that you've had a long time to be able to adjust to things like this. It's definitely happened to you before. It shouldn't take any more time to be able to get over this. You guys should be able to bounce back from it. Sharks power play goal number one. Andrew Kopp gets a little too aggressive here. So when you can see his eyes, you want to contain. Kopp should actually be backing up into his zone here and putting his stick out into the middle. But Kopp's actually going to take more of an aggressive route, which takes him out of the play. You want to be aggressive on the penalty kill, but you want to be aggressive when you see players' backs or when the puck is in dispute, meaning they fumble it. You don't want to be aggressive when you can clearly see his eyes. That is a moment to contain. That's a moment to back up. And what happens is that puck is able to swing all the way around down to here. And you can see it. I mean, you got one, two jets. They're not in the play. This is a very dangerous shot for Hellebuck. You can see he's in the middle of changing his angle. But once again, look how deep Hellebuck is into his crease. This isn't going to allow him to challenge this angle. So because the puck ended up changing angles across the Royal Road. You can see Hellebuck having to make his push, but as we go forward one more frame, he's just so deep into his crease that this top corner is wide open. And there you go. Puck's right here, and we have way too much daylight based on the angle that Hellebuck had to take here, but we talk about it on this channel all the time. The Royal Road. The puck crosses that Royal Road. The goalie has to change angles, and that angle is dangerous to change. It is the best chance in hockey, and that's why this puck goes in. So yeah, he's a little too deep into his crease, but again, the Jets allowed him to cross the Royal Road. Danger Will Robinson. All right, goal number three. Unfortunately, this one's on Brendan Dillon. It's never on one person, but this one, Dillon needs to make a better play. So we got Brendan Dillon here in front of the net, and the puck's just been shot. It's somewhere here in this mess. It's a two-on-one, and when you're playing on a penalty kill, you got to stay loose. And loose just means active sticks and not tying up a man. You're never playing the body on a penalty kill. You're always being aware that you might have to play two players instead of one because there's going to be an odd man situation somewhere so you don't want to tie yourself up with body contact but what Dylan ends up doing here is engaging in a pushing match instead of looking for the puck and keeping his stick on the ice and the pucks actually snuck out to a boat right here now and we can see San Jose is wide open on the doorstep the other thing the Jets got to do is you got to get low like you can't be standing there watching every single player has to immediately retreat to the net but this is a concern this isn't a skating stride down here this is a gliding stride 
and you can't be gliding after a puck shot on net. You got to be skating hard back to the house. And then finally, the final goal, pucks right here. You got one, two, three Jets that actually just lost a battle on their own blue line. You lose those battles and you allow zone entry and problems happen. And that's what happens here. And again, it's a battle of wills. The Jets allow three chances from the Sharks before this one finally goes in. First battle that lost is right here. Hellebuck makes a beautiful kick save here post to post this battle is lost but this battle is made up for by Connor Hellebuck the second battle that's lost is the puck actually squirts out to here and San Jose gets another chance on it so that's two chances Connor Hellebuck makes a second gorgeous save but that puck's gonna pop out to here and you're gonna see the goal come in but again look at the skates this isn't urgency these are not players that are skating back to tie up a man this is the wrong side of the puck right here this is this is not the correct side of the puck you need to be striding as hard as you can to get in front of those loose pucks there's just no sense of urgency from the jets playing in their own d zone tonight and again you can see the gliding you can see the push it's not going to do anything. Puck's right here. Too easy. Hellebuck did everything he could. Puck goes in. All right, so now that you've seen the goals, hopefully that helps you understand my point that this was two separate Jets teams. There's very few positive things for a, from a coach's perspective or even the player's perspective to take when you can see four goals that have very clear evidence of the team, the whole team, not working in unison. They're not playing proper D zone. There's no sense of urgency. Their skates are pointed in the wrong direction. They're on the wrong side of the puck. They're not skating hard to help their goalie. Their goalie is too back, far back in the crease. And you know what? I would be too far back in the crease too if I was panicked about it because Hellebuck thinks he has to stand on his head. Goalies can see this stuff. They know when their team isn't playing with urgency. So he ends up going back into his net, which is a habit goaltenders will do when they're just the confidence is a little bit shaken off of them. So this is not complete panic, but we're getting there. These are not the signs of an oh shucks team, a team that has been together with the core like the Jets have had for four to six years now needs to be able to shake these off and win games. And they've lost four key points in a clogged up central division to two teams that just aren't that good. Not taking anything away from the Sharks, the Ducks. They all have good players, no easy games in the NHL, but those are four points that are going to come back to haunt the Jets. All right, so you lose to Anaheim, you lose to San Jose, and there's clearly either an attitude or a systems problem or a chemistry problem, but there's a problem. The Jets are not playing in unison. All six players on the ice are not playing for one another. They have broken D zone plays. They're stretched out way too far between forwards and defensemen in the neutral zone. The chemistry isn't driving and just not what you would expect having a coach like Paul Maurice who's been around for as long as he has with this core so what does it mean for Winnipeg now well when the owner pushes all in like Mark Chipman has allowed Kevin Shevel day off to do to butt against the cap and this is the start there's a short leash and you gotta think that the organization it's not gonna panic after two games but we're fans and we like to play armchair GM. Winnipeg doesn't have a very tough schedule for the first 10 games. It's unfortunate they have to go on the road trip they have to go on, but they're playing teams that are not challenging. So the schedule isn't favorable, but the teams are. The Jets are also supposed to be good enough to overcome that adversity. So if the Jets actually end up below 500 or at 500 at the 10 game mark, it's a hot take, but that may be the mark where Shevel Dayoff starts considering a coaching change for Paul Maurice. It's more likely at the 20 or 25 game mark if there's a pre if there's a problem. And what we know from Kevin Sheveldayoff is he's patient and the Jets organization can shake things off pretty easily at the head office, it seems. There's really little drama that goes on in the Jets organization. But the hot take is you got to start thinking they're going to be looking at Maurice at game 10 if they come out of this road trip at 500. I mean, the first 10 games, yeah, okay, they got two at home, eight on the road. So it's not a full road trip, but Minnesota is really their only competition in the first part of the season. They got a lot of L.A a lot of San Jose and a lot of Ducks. This is where they're supposed to be picking up a lot of points. You're 0-4. So 10 games is the mark where the hot take is they're going to be looking at them. But if you're under 500 at the 20 game mark, yeah, I think Maurice is absolutely on the hot seat at that point because you just don't pay the type of money you're willing to pay for guys like Schmidt and Dylan if you're not committed to the cup. And frankly, if you're under 500 at that point, you're not even playoff ready. The statistics say that at the 25 game mark, 80% of the teams at the 25 game mark that are in a playoff position will continue to hold their playoff position. So that means only two or three teams are going to switch out. The game is an, the season is an 82 game season, but statistically, 
realistically speaking, at the 25 game mark, it's a large enough sample size that not many things change because you're only dealing with one and two points. So it is a little bit risky waiting for that 20 to 25 game mark, according to advanced analytics, to make that kind of change and hope it works out. But we've seen Stanley Cup teams do it before. St. Louis, yeah, wasn't a coaching change, but they had an atrocious first half, came back and won the Stanley Cup. Pittsburgh Penguins fire Bysma. They end up winning a Stanley Cup with Mike Sullivan. Pittsburgh Penguins ended up firing the coach to get Dan Blyzma. They ended up winning a Stanley Cup. Sullivan won two back-to-back. Blyzma won one. Two of those happened on a coaching change. Paul Maurice was actually fired for Peter Laviolette, and then the Canes went on to win the Stanley Cup that year. So Paul Maurice actually fallen victim to this once before and lost the chance at a Stanley Cup ring because of it. So this wouldn't be unfamiliar territory for Maurice. And again, I'm not saying I like Maurice, don't like Maurice. It doesn't matter what your opinion is of him. This team is committed to the cup this year. They're going to have to do something. There's no way they're going to let 82 games walk away without throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at this problem to try to salvage it. And 0-2 against the Ducks and the Sharks is not where you want to be. So that's my hot take of what's going on in Winnipeg Jets land. Catch us here tomorrow where we break down week one of the NHL. We'll give you our power rankings. We'll talk about the statistics the top players in the league and we'll end up breaking down everything that we saw in the NHL in week one. So Jets fans, thanks for tuning in. Hockey fans, we'll see you all tomorrow where we talk about every other team and what happened in this crazy week for the NHL. So thanks for tuning in. Catch you in the next video.